starter. He played more games, hit more homers than any catcher, is synonymous with one of the greatest moments in World Series history, the original Pudge. Let's welcome Hall of Famer Carlton Fisk. Eleven-time All-Star, two-time All-Star MVP, the lifeblood of the Montreal Expos, known as the Kid. He brought a world championship to Shea Stadium with the Mets. Let's welcome Hall of Famer Gary Carter. Played 17 seasons with the Big Red Machine, awarded 10 gold gloves, two MVPs, the starting catcher on Major League Baseball's all-century team. Let's welcome Hall of Famer, the late, great Johnny Bench. <laughs> and he played on more pennant winners, 14 world champions, 10 than any other player in history. He is a three-time MVP. We are in his house. The one, the only, Yogi Berra. Before we talk about what is the uniqueness of being a catcher, the first thing many people on our audience want to know tonight are nicknames. Pudge, where did it come from? Well, it's pretty obvious when you, if you realize that I weighed 36 pounds when I was a year old and never really outgrew that. I mean, I weighed 120 pounds when I was in fifth grade and never uh, grew into that until I was 14 or 15 years old. So I was past my freshman year in high school when I started to stretch out. As a matter of fact, I grew from the, from the beginning of one year, like January, to the beginning of my junior year I grew eight inches in that particular eight month period so um, the nickname stuck but the look did not but you always had a, <laughs> a laid-back way to the game when you went to the mound they called it the pudge trudge because you took your time <laughs> Pudge trudge. <laughs> I always felt as though as being a catcher I was in control of the game I was in control of the pace of the game I want to control my pitching staff I, although I wanted to let him, you know, so maybe sometimes we didn't have the best pitching staff, so I had to control his emotions and try to get him to give me his best. So uh, it was all in an effort to, to, uh, to win the game. And you know it. <laughs> is that why? Is that why so the I games put down more than one finger when I played? You know, <laughs> Pudge. Is that why the it's games like, well, he played well, in no. were the longest games that they uh, not in American League history? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing, wait a second. One other thing on my own defense here was that when the game first started, there was only a starter, and then if he got in trouble, there was a reliever, <clears throat> and then as the game progressed over the the next decade or two or three there became more specialized guys. So every time there was a change, there was a trip to the mound. So now you got four or five pitching changes. That adds to the length of the game. And you know I it. feel better you about it. You know it. it. <laughs> right here. Now I'm, I'm sure it's right. Jumping in over here on the right, right was someone called The Kid. Right. Where'd The Kid come Started from? Started first big league spring training camp. And um, uh, I was 18 years old, excited. And, of course, back then, veterans were, you know, kind of looked at as royalty. You know, you bowed down to them and all. Well, I was invited to a card game at the um, Americana Hotel, which was our team hotel. And I was able to watch them play cards. It was like Mike Jorgensen and Mike Torres, Kenny Singleton, Tim Foley, all those guys. And then finally, all of a sudden, Mike Torres says, hey, kid, why don't you go get us some ice cream? So I ran down, <laughs> ran across the street, 31 flavors, and brought them all back their ice cream that they wanted. And the way I was, just kind of a very enthusiastic, tried to win every race, and wanted to take you know, an extra swing in every batting practice and all, the name stuck, and uh, it's nice to be almost 50 and be called the kid again. You know? <laughs> Yogi, how did Lorenzo Pietro uh, Barra uh, become Yogi? Well, I became when I was 16 years old playing American Legion ball. Bobby Huffman played with the New York Giants. We were on the same club. You know, we didn't have dugouts when we played. We sat on the ground. And I always had my legs crossed and my arms crossed. And he said, I look like a yogi. <laughs> <laughs> this guy here was called 
JB. Even I can figure that out. Well, I was actually called a little general uh, early. Really? <clears throat> yeah, I just, I just felt like everybody had to be on the field. Everybody had to do the right thing. You know, with the kid taking, you know, one more swing, that wasn't going to get it. I mean, everybody, you were supposed to be doing this. You're supposed to be doing that. It was cut and dry. And I was anal. Yeah. I mean, I was. I mean, I thought there was only one way you're supposed to do things, and that's the baseball way. But, Johnny, this is a very important point. You are all Hall of Fame catchers. You all believe passionately it's the best position in baseball because on the field, you are the general. We are. We are. We are totally Talk in about control. That. Even though the, if you go down the background of all of us, none of us were catchers. I mean, our backgrounds is somewhere else. What were you, a shortstop? Shortstop. shortstop. Yeah. Yeah. Left fielder and shortstop. Yogi actually didn't play professional catcher until professional. professionally. And I was the third baseman because we had a kid in high school because we had 10 out for baseball. We only had 21 kids in the graduating class. We had one kid that would catch and wouldn't play third. And so I played third, and I went to American Legion and said another town, and so I was a first baseman. But we all learned other positions, but we all... I don't know if in their hearts, but I mean, in our hearts, we all felt like we were catchers, even though I think we would have taken all anything. We felt like we were in charge, right. regardless of what position we played. I mean, in my adult life, I was always the commander. It was the general. I was the commander, but I never surfaced above Pudge. But uh, I think being a catcher, the, way we, the reason we all became catchers is because we were sort of natural-born leaders. Talk about the technique of catching. <clears throat> What's expected of you? Well, I think it's important for, for my sake. I, I tried to study all the hitters. I would like to try to remember who was hot, who was not. And I was one of the ones that kind of ran the team meetings and stuff and tried to, you know, tell my pitchers this is the way we're going to approach the game. And they had a lot of confidence in me. And when I would put a pitch down, most of the time they would go with that. I mean, if they didn't, you know, that's okay. We, we go to another pattern. But basically, I think that the importance of a catcher is to know all of the other, you know, players on the other teams and know how to call a game. I think it's important more than anything. Being able to block pitches in the dirt, being able to block home plate, being able to throw runners out, that's another thing. But to be able to handle 10 personalities, now maybe 11 personalities, is something that takes a little bit more of a challenge. And uh, to be able to call a game for each one of those guys and know which guys you can pat on the back, which guys you got to kick in the butt, out. right? And <laughs> which guys that you can say, hey, you're doing a great job when you're in the dugout. Yogi, this was all before computers. And now you pick up USA Today and you see little boxes where yeah. the balls go and things like that. You had to have it in your head mm -hmm. that when Ted Williams came to the plate, plate, at a certain point of the game, what pitch you wanted, what do you No, it depends what Here, park we were in. Here's what Yogi It all did. depends what park you were in. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, Ted Williams pitch it before. All right. <laughs> no, we didn't do that. No. <laughs> no. 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 In, uh, in Boston, we pitched uh, Ted in and out. In the Yankee Stadium, we pitched away. If you wanted to walk, good for him. <laughs> he ain't going to get any ball of pool in but, the Yankee Stadium. But Yogi, Stadium. you used to talk to Ted Williams when he was trying oh, to Oh, yeah, he used to tell me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say to him, Yogi? I said, where are you going tonight, Ted? You know, where are you going fishing and all that stuff. <laughs> but I believe what, what uh, Carter says here. You know, pitchers think it's they're Gary. dumb. To it's me, Gary. I think Gary they're Carter. dumb. Gary Carter, <laughs> Mr. Carter. I think pitchers are the dumbest guys on the me. Oh, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Whitey Ford, they call home. Know, <laughs> Whitey never shook me off. But I'm just saying, you go in, like he's talking a team meeting, they, uh, the one guy said, well, this guy can't hit a curveball. And I would pop up, yeah, he can't hit your curveball, but he could hit his. <laughs> right. That, 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 that is the whole key. Yeah. Right. I mean, that whole key. Right. Gary, I didn't, we, never, we never had, the meeting was, here's what this guy's doing. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't want any pitchers in my meeting. That's right. I want, every, I want everything to know what comes from me. Right. But it was always that. It was always amazing that this guy couldn't hit a curveball. Yeah. He can hit your curveball. Right. I'm going to tell you what, you don't have a curveball. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like there was flat. guys. There, was guys, there were guys that you pitched. You didn't, I mean, if you walked Williams, fine. Right. Yeah. I mean, the amazing thing is that people always thought this guy walked four guys in the game so he didn't have control. I walked three of them. Right. I didn't want them swinging the bats. I can get the next guy out right. or the guy in the dugout still coming out. I mean, there's few guys in your life that you never could get out. Willie McCovey. I had no clue. I, to this day, I still don't know how to get Willie McCovey out, but that's fine. He wasn't going to beat me in a game. But as Yogi said, 
That's fine. Look, they, they had no clue. I mean, most of them had no clue, and if they did, you admired them and respected them. If Seaver was pitching, you let him shake you off. If another guy was out there, you walked out the mound and said, don't you ever shake me off of <laughs> you were, And you would have been the first one to go out there, too. I know that. I went out there because this guy had no clue And you clue took a while doing on. it, but go ahead. <laughs> I had to figure out how I was going to approach him, approach him without hurting his feelings so bad that he wouldn't pitch. You know? <laughs> so what did you do, Pudge? So you'd go out exactly. there and you'd... Exactly let him know I let him know that I was in charge and he was not in charge if he thought that pitch was going to get somebody out he was sorely mistaken so I always felt as though that what I tried to do behind the plate one I tried to think which was something the pitchers never did catchers <laughs> tried to and I tried to be somewhat creative in what I asked him to do now, in, in that whole thing, you got to realize how fragile the pitchers are, so you can't ask him to do with something he can't deliver, even though you know in that situation that would be the right thing to do. So then you have to sort of back around and do all this kind of stuff. And You it, went out there and spent all this time. They had no clue. It's exactly right. <laughs> exactly. We had a time. We had them confused. We've got to go. We'll get, we'll get back to this later. But well, I had a guy that said, comes, he's pitching one day, and he comes, and he comes back on the bench and says, Boy, I just can't get into it today. I don't know what the story is. And I went, Wah! I slapped him upside the head and said, You can't get into it today. I got to catch every day, 150 days a year. You pitch 30 times a year, and you can't get into it. You better get into it, or I'm going to kick your butt. Now, in, defense, in defense of pitchers, I asked Whitey Ford one time about all these yogiisms. I said, Whitey, did Yogi say all the things they say? He said, It's worse than you think. Whitey, Whitey said he was out with Mickey one night, came to the park the next day, and a little bit prepared to pitch, probably not yeah. in his best shape. And he said, Chicago White Sox, first ball, Nellie Fox, single to right. Second pitch, Louis Aparicio, single to left. Third pitch, he hit Minnie Minoso. Fourth ball he threw, Ted Klazuski, gone, grand slam. Four balls, four nothing, White Sox. Casey Stengel ran to the mound. Yogi ran to the mound. Casey said, hey, Yogi, why do you have a stuff tonight? Yogi said, how the hell did I go? I haven't caught a ball yet. <laughs> is a tough position on the wear and tear on the body. Johnny Bench, you've had a broken ankle, a broken left foot, a broken left foot, a broken finger, and seven broken athletic supporter cups. <laughs> True? It's amazing. I had actually... Get that thing out of the way! <laughs> it's, I've had 15 broken bones in each... or 12 broken bones in each foot, but it's amazing that people, even these sick people out here today, well, imagine that you mentioned 15 broken bones. I had lung surgery, shoulder surgery, I've had hip surgery now. And that when you mention seven broken cups, they say, oh, that hurt. <laughs> <laughs> it's just well, it did. Hey, I know it really hurt. <laughs> and Yogi, Yogi to this, is just telling us that he has had, ne he'd never had a broken cup. But no you have to understand, fingers. Yogi, at whatever height he is, he never <laughs> squatted. So everything was like this to begin with. So there was no way that he could get hit. You were the first catcher of any prominence to wear a protective helmet. Yeah, Sherman Lawler won the helmet. I kept throwing the helmet, breaking it. It cost me $35 to replace the helmet. And I kept getting these foul tips that, that I would throw to second, the mask would go sideways. And I said, I've got to be able to find a better way of doing this. And so I had seen Sherm, Sherm Lawler at some point wearing a helmet. I said, you know, if I wear my helmet, I can't throw it. I have to have it on my head. I'd make it out. I'd turn it around, put on the mask, and, it, and as a result, everybody started doing it. One-handed catching became part of what uh, Randy Hundley did. So it was all sort of a copy. Everything is sort of a copy of somebody, but it was just sort of like... I had developed a style that worked for me. Pudge, what was the wear and tear on your body for catching in the major leagues for so long? Oh, how, how long do you have? Yeah. How many knee surgeries? You know, I've had my left knee reconstructed in, uh, in 1974, has have, have had it operate on four times since, had my left op my right knee operate on three times. I've had two operations on this hand and one on uh, that hand. Um, and I never I operated on my cup. And I and I wore, <laughs> and after and I got hit in the in the head with a backswing, uh, in the minor leagues, with a cloth hat on, when I was catching. So then I went to a, you know, a helmet catching, 
and uh, after the first two or three broken plastic cups, I went to a, a metal cup, so I never did uh, break a cup after that. But Gary Carter, all of you here on the stage knew that by being a major league catcher, you were going to shorten your careers. That if you played another position, you right. probably could have a few more years in the bigs. And yet you chose to be the He catcher. wouldn't have been Gary Carter. I don't no. know if anybody ever uh, He wouldn't have been Carl right. I you, wouldn't don't. Have been. you don't. You don't. I was lucky. When I was you're young. short. These guys are all tall. They uh, <laughs> work like hell. Except I didn't John. have to work that hard. Yeah. See, see, I Tim, I, I don't know if I would have enjoyed the game or had as much success if it wasn't for being behind the plate. If I'd have played another position, I don't think I, like John said. Oh, you'd have had a rubber locker. Yeah. You'd have been bouncing off, bouncing the off the walls. I mean, it's not Because like I, I just had a lot of enthusiasm, and I, I, I loved the game. And when Carlton was talking about his surgeries and all, I've had 14 major surgeries. I've had nine knee surgeries, seven on my right, two on my left. I'm going to have another one in December on my left. I've had you know, two broken oh, thumbs. No, all great. these things, but I'm saying all of us have been through that. But that's the thing that we appreciate about our position. We have been through it. We've been through the war, basically, because, and, and we would play with these injuries. I know John played with, with uh, broken bones and so did Pudge, and I know Yog maybe he didn't know that he had them, but anyway, <laughs> he would play with Well, they wouldn't take you to surgery. Well, they wait, wouldn't. Wait, 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 Yogi, the nose. You got oh, hit in the nose. Oh, that's the only one. And, and, <laughs> and, and tell, tell what happened after you got hit in the nose. I got a broken nose. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happened. Hey, no, funny. Hey, what else happened? Hey, hey. Oh, no, I was trying to. I was trying to. I was trying to tee up, Yogi. Let's take it again, Yogi. Tell us what happened when you broke your nose. The funny part, I had sinus trouble. I really did. I had sinus trouble. And when I broke my nose, I never had sinus trouble. <laughs> if you couldn't be a catcher, you had to play one other position on a baseball team. What would it be? Uh, for me, probably first base. You? Well, outfield, left outfield. field, yeah, man. Shortstop. Pitch. I want the days off. <laughs> oh, man. I want to play golf. I want to throw hard. I want to throw at breaking ball. I want to knock people on their ass. <laughs> yeah, but you also want that whole thing. You get your lunch too, you know. No, no, I'm a. You'll dude. get your lunch. I'm, I'll be in the American League where all the wimps play. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that way they wouldn't have your weak You wouldn't pitchers. have your weak bat in the lineup either. That's the thing. You, Johnny, Johnny, you just raised an interesting point. Knock them on their ass, quote unquote. Who called the brush back pitches? You or the pitcher? It worked both ways. It, it worked both ways. ways. There were pitchers out there. There were certain guys, you know that. There were certain guys, you Lamar and all those talk. guys. They would knock people down just in a heartbeat. They right. wanted people. I mean, you had to back off. There were managers that, that walked up to the pitcher and said, I want him down. Right. And there were guys yeah. that did it, and there were automatics yeah. that you already yeah. knew to protect your yeah. other guys. But I'm sure Yogi, my gosh, Yogi that. back farther back than we were, they had a written, it was just yeah. written. You had a home yeah. run, the next guy yeah, went, down. went down. Yogi was part of the game. Yeah, it was part of the game, is right. It was, uh, I had two pitchers tell me to go to hit me. Dizzy Trout and Gary Bell. Kid. They hit me. Before the game? Yeah. Before I mean, the game. You hit before me. the game. You hit right. me too good, they said. You so got to get gonna it. So we're going to knock you down. But they didn't hit you in the head. No, they hit the butt. They could hit you. But <laughs> there there was some honor in a brushback. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that it was an important part of the game, Gary Carter. Yes, it to was. To establish control and respect. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the pitchers of today, because of the rule that's been implemented, where if they throw in and, and there's these brushbacks and all, that there could be um, a, a pitcher ejected. Okay, because they're coming in and the warning to the benches and if they come inside and they hit somebody, they're ejected from the game. I think it should still be a part of the game. It's important for a pitcher to establish inside. If he doesn't work inside, he's going to lose his control. And that's why the success for guys like Randy Johnson and Pedro Martinez and Kurt Schilling and guys like that. And when you're talking about knocking somebody down, you know the part of the game, when to do it, when not to do it. You don't want to wake the opposing team up sometimes. But I think that the other part is, is that you get a feel for it. If a guy has slid into one of your guys and has tried to hurt him, and you can see the feel of the game, then that's when you've got to go inside and knock him down. Simple as that. You don't want to be a headhunter, though. No. No, you know, no. I think there's some honor in that. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest reasons that you see some of these obscene offensive numbers going up on the board because there is no fear. Yeah, but there was also but, the other side of it where if you threw at a guy 
I mean, let sleeping dogs lie. Oh. You woke a guy yeah. up. Oh, I my Frank God. Robinson. Oh, Frank Robinson. You didn't want to throw it at him because he oh, got man. mean. He oh, got yeah, absolutely mean. And, I, and I, the same way. I loved it. If somebody threw it at me, I was going to get fired up. Go ahead. Throw at me. And me you I can't drill him right now. No, not me at all. No. I swear. Give you a little adrenaline. You know, it's like, it was like my boy from Oklahoma. I never met a man I didn't like. Yogi never met a pitch. He didn't like. Right. Right. Who was the yeah. toughest pitcher for you to hit? Uh, it was uh, Rick Russell and Bill Singer. I never could see him. Never picked him up. For me, Nolan Ryan. And I'd go Nolan Ryan. He'd, he'd, he'd... Nolan Ryan and Frank Tanana, when, before Frank hurt his arm, you'd go out there and you'd be over it. You'd think you don't even belong in the same league. Right. Or you go to Baltimore when you had those 420 game winners over there. You go, you come out of there one for four pitchers and you go, I don't think I can play at this level. I really don't. <laughs> for me, it was a guy by the name of Don Robinson, played for uh, the Pirates. I don't know what it was, but this guy, I just didn't get any hits on him. He was meaner than a snake. I, I hit the ball say. hard sometimes, but it was right at somebody. He was a meaner than a snake, too. Yeah, he was. Oh. Yogi, he had a big old head. Who had your number? <laughs> Herb Score, I see. <laughs> Herb Score had his eye knocked out by Gil McDougall on my birthday, yep, May 7th. Yep, I remember it as a kid. Wow. wow. Terrible day. Yeah, maybe he had good stuff, just like Kofax. I don't know. You guys faced Kofax, John. Yeah. You faced. Did you face school fights? No, you're, you're really old, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was over with the Mets, they told me, you're lucky you don't have to bat against school fight. I said, you should have bat him when he couldn't find home plate. <laughs> <laughs>. It's never happened. It's over 100 years. And, uh, what, about the slide, what about the slide Robinson at home? Well, play? I want to talk about uh, that. If you guys give me permission, might I talk yeah, about no, that? Sure. Thank you, guys. Sure. Yeah, 19... Out. <laughs> <laughs> Yogi, I haven't even explained to the audience what we're talking about. What slide is that? <laughs> Thank you, Pudge. Was not... that, wasn't he going like this? Yeah. I had the umpire <laughs> Didn't you get upset, Yogi? Right. Oh. All, all right. 19... <laughs> let me set the stage. 1955. Whitey Ford's on the mound. Jackie Robinson, oh, he was out. With Yogi, <laughs> he's on third base. You're behind the plate. All right, let's see that footage. This let's is, roll that this footage. Is drama. Oh, let's roll oh that my footage. God. Let's roll it. There he, there, goes. He goes. there he goes. There he goes. There he goes. Look at there's the slide. Perfect slide. Safe. Oh. He's Yogi. Look at that. Oh. Yogi. Look at you, no. Yogi. Look no at way. Yogi. No Yogi. No way. You would have got suspended Yogi. too, Yogi. Yogi. <laughs> Yogi you tagged him in back of the plate. So yeah. Yeah. The plate. Yogi. Yogi, the you know what? went like this. What does that mean? I'm going to tell you what. <laughs> if, <laughs> if, still if, out. If, what do you mean? How can he be safe and still out? If Whitey had thrown the fastball, there wouldn't have been any question marks. <laughs> <laughs> no, what was he winding up for when he got on third base? Help me out because he moved away. What pitch he did Whitey throw on him? Fastball. It was. Yeah. That was a fastball. It was a, oh, it was a slow fastball. Sure, was it was a, a slow shame. fastball? Yeah. <laughs> was Whitey losing his stuff back no, then? No, we Was he that? scuffing it in those no. days too? Pudge, <laughs> <laughs> uh, your greatest moment? Um, probably a, a moment would be the home run against some guy's team that's sitting next to me <laughs> over here that there? that it was in the later part of the game and uh, it won the game because it stayed fair. All right, the, the Red Sox won that series three games to four. That's exactly right. Oh! <laughs> All right, let's let three games to four. We won. There she goes. Let's don't, watch it. Don't override watch the play watch by him. play, man. Watch All right, him. Watch him. Watch. Hit it. Hit it. Stay fair. Stay fair. Yes! That's a fair ball, and there's a happy man right there. Joe Morgan said, hey, I was trying to wave it foul, and you waved it fair. I said, Joe, I'm a lot bigger than you. <laughs> so, Johnny, did you say the Red Sox went on to win that World Series? Yeah, we did. Yeah, actually, yeah we did. Actually, uh, it, was, it was probably the greatest game in World Series history. I mean, it was just an amazing thing, and uh, Carlton really worked it over that moment. He hammed it up so bad. I got it. <laughs> I'm almost embarrassed for it. I'm I, almost I, embarrassed I for the rest that. of us catching <laughs> I had a plan that would work just It was like a that. good sinker, actually, down, and he, he went and got it, and it was, uh, you know, for that... Bernie Carbo hit the three-run homer in the in the early part of the game. Eighth inning. Up. Eighth inning, tied the game up, and then they actually loaded the bases in the nine with nobody out. I got crossed up the pitch. We've been using these signs for eight months, folks. I got crossed up on the pitch, and I probably wouldn't have caught the ball 
And Denny Doyle would have scored from third, but Fred Lynn swung at it, hit it down the left field line. George Foster. Oh, about 200 feet out there. Who he? hadn't thrown out a guy all year, yeah. but he had 49 home runs, drove in 152 <laughs> runs, so he didn't have to throw anybody out. <laughs> anyway, he, Don Zimmer's the third base coach, and he's saying, no, 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 and Denny thought he said, go, go, go. <laughs> he tries to score, tags up, and it's a double play, and I tell, I tell McEnany, I said, you crossed me up. I gave you one, two, three, one, three for the slider, and he said, yeah, I guess I did. Well, sometimes those things work out, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> and walk back to the mound. I mean, it was, like, it was just amazing. But the 12th game, then we were lucky enough to come back. In the seventh game yeah. and won the series. And then swept the Yankees the next year. Yeah. But once uh, again. Uh, 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 you really know how you yeah. hold the crowd hey. right there, Johnny. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Boy, these catchers are geniuses. You guys have had enough. Yeah. You've had enough. If you have been out there in Yogi's Museum, and if you haven't been, you should be here. He's got 412 World Series rings out there on this. <laughs> That's right, sure. <laughs> P Pudge, 1975, seventh game, Red Sox. Oh, you act like you're so disappointed. Nin 1986, the Mets, Red Sox. And now the playoff game against the Yankees this past year. Is there a curse? He's moved to Chicago. Is there a curse? Um, I spent 75 in that, uh, in that town playing. And then 86, I wasn't there. And this year, obviously, I wasn't there. The curse, <laughs> I believe, is a manifestation of the media. And they get every ounce or every mile of, uh, of workings out of that. You know, I don't think the players ever think about that. You know, I know uh, players don't read about that. You know, they like to read their stats. They like to read what the other team's doing. But as far as some editorial on the third page of the sports page where some guy invokes the bam curse of the Bambino or in Chicago, the Cubs, the, the curse of the goat or whatever it is out there. Um, you know, I don't, I, it's the players playing. It has no, and the curse isn't it. Sometimes you have good luck, sometimes you have bad luck. Sometimes in a Haley's situation. Haley's Comet has come and gone twice since you guys won. <laughs> and, and, and why do they have divers? Build a new park! Wait a minute. But that has Chicago, that has Boston, build a new park! That has nothing to do. It's a to do with the curse. It just has to do with your one out too short, one pitcher too short, one inning short. They still so, believe it up there. And they, and some people believe hey, uh, hey, it. Yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. <laughs> I never believed it. But why do they have divers going out and looking for Babe's piano in the lake? <laughs> Look at the players now and compare it to video when you guys played. Right. They are big. These guys today all lift weights. <laughs> Yogi, you told me that you were not allowed to lift weights. We weren't allowed to lift weights. We weren't either. Yeah. Why not? No. They came in at the beginning. Well, you get yeah. tight. You couldn't tight. do it. In those tight. days, there weren't we, the same We couldn't even go weights. swimming. You actually go bulked swimming. up. Couldn't go swimming. Yeah, you couldn't didn't develop swim. muscles across the chest to the throw. The thing is, there's a difference between functional strength and gym strength. Everybody thought if you lift the weights, you're going to go in the in come out looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And if you did go lift unsupervised weight training, then you actually strengthened the wrong muscles for the sport that you were playing in. And that's where the premise was that everybody would get tight and you couldn't throw the ball. But functional strength, sports specific strength, and I got into that at the you know late in my career. But I played, you know, like when I was 36 or 37, um, and I played for until I was 45, that the functional strength was the most important part about the conditioning program in that a stronger, better conditioned athlete in your sport is going to be a better player. And nobody believed that until it was proven. You take a look at some of the guys now, they look like, oh, I mean, they look... Hercules. <laughs> uh, they do too much to me, I think. They, 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 like you said, the, the off scene, they're starting to work out right now. That's right. Some of them. That's right. They come to spring training. You know, they do. They get tired of it. I don't think they put out as much in spring training that they did in the... Uh, when because they, they don't have to get out. in shape That's in spring right. training. They don't have to. They probably could take spring training and break it back, back down, down to maybe 
four weeks instead of seven weeks. Oh, we did when we come out of clubhouse, run around the park. That's all. Do your exercise. Jumping jacks. Jumping jacks. That's all. <laughs> play a little fun. Go, <laughs> jumping and go jacks. Get and go play a little them. pepper. And go yeah. get them, baby. You're yeah. ready. Then you run like heck. Too. Another you run. huge change, and you gentlemen know it better than anybody, is the money. Yogi, what was your biggest <coughs> tally, your biggest payday as a player? 65000 60, Gary? Mine, fortunately, in 1988, and again, this is when the era changed in the early 80s, uh, Dave Winfield was the one that kind of broke the bank with George Steinbrenner when he signed that 10-year contract for $20 million and uh, was making $2 million a year. I fortunately got to the level of about 2.3 in 1989. And prior to that? Prior to that, my minimum salary of first year in 1975 was 16000 <laughs> Biggest payday. Uh, I made six thousand my first year, and I got up to twelve fifty an hour after that. <laughs> <laughs> More than you're making tonight, big guy. <laughs> That's about you right. Too. Too. <laughs> <laughs> That's just about right. You know, everybody can talk about how yeah. the game has changed, yeah. and specifically in that area. You know, I don't know if it's important to say, well, what did you make? You know, your first year, I can tell you what I made. That caught 144 games. I was on the All-Star team. I was the first ever in American League and unanimous choice rookie of the year. Uh, and I made $11,500. And believe me, you know, when you go through, you know, the normal salary increases, but we ran into a lot of things that the kids aren't running into now either. I had to worry about to, you know, weekend National Guard duty. I, all the labor contract problems that we all had, you know, the collusion in the middle eighties where, mm -hmm. where it knocked down the salary level. So, you know, none of us made anything what's going on now. The only thing that really bothers all of us, and I can't, shouldn't speak for everybody, but for me is that the attitude with which they, they, not all, the players, feel that they're entitled to make this kind of money and they look down on the players that came before them in that they are somewhat inferior because they didn't make as much money so therefore they determine they are better players than we are failing to realize that the reason that the players are experiencing such a level of affluence now is because we in our beginning of our career basically set the foundation for the system that allows them to do that so uh, personally, that's the only thing that I feel uh, offended by is that the attitude with which the players make their money. Not every era that you ever played in, every era that ever was in the game, the best players always made the most money mm -hmm. for whatever era that they were. The best players always made the most money. And it still holds true now. The best players still make the most. But what bothers me and a lot of players is that the players that can't play no, I shouldn't say can't play because they're major league players. The players that aren't as accomplished still are making oodles of dough, you know, more than oodles of dough. It's like the guys <coughs> on uh, CNBC. <laughs> Sunday morning guys? Sunday morning guys. Yeah, especially. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. So how much did you make in your best year, uh, Tim? <laughs> Working man in news business right there, man, huh? <laughs> not enough, Johnny. Not enough, not yeah. enough. Oh, so you're you making $20 an hour. What, uh, is it? what do you think Yogi Berra could make in 2003? Well, With his number. Now he can't run worth anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think at his age, George wouldn't pay him more than 12 or 15 a year. <laughs> in his prime? Million. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, there's I no question. It. Okay. Oh, no, $12 million no, no. a year, Yogi. That wouldn't be bad. <laughs> <laughs>
himself, of Neon Dion. And it just didn't fit into the game of baseball, at least for the team he played for and for the rivalry of the teams at the time. You know, the Red Sox and the Yankees I'm speaking of. And we go to Yankee Stadium, and Yankee Stadium is the house that Ruth built. It's with the facade. I mean, it has more history than, I mean, the first time I stepped into Yankee Stadium, it was almost a religious experience for me. I walked around the outfield. I went and looked at the monuments. I mean, it was just like, what am I doing here? I mean, with all the guys that played here and all the championships and the players that come through here, and here comes Deion Sanders through here, who wasn't a baseball player, I grant, I grant you that. Uh, but he comes through and he's wearing the Yankee pinstripes. And one night against the Yankees, uh, uh, playing against the Yankees, he comes up, man on base, he has to pop up to the infield and doesn't move. He just stands there and goes, mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of people do that, but to, pre to preface that whole thing, he used to come up to home plate and take his bat and draw a dollar sign in the dirt. He'd draw a dollar sign in the dirt. And I go, all right, so. <laughs> so he hits this ball. I mean, he, every time he came up, he'd do that. He hits this ball, it doesn't run. And he stands there and stands there. And I said, run the ball out. And he goes, what? I said, run the ball out, you piece of <laughs> so he runs up and takes a little right turn about the coach, you know, about the 45-foot marker and goes into the dugout. He comes back up the next time up. That's the same friggin' thing, you know, the dollar sign in the dirt. I don't know if I had to be telling this on TV or not. <laughs> dollar sign in the dirt. I go, oh, man, I'm ready. No. This guy's just really going to take it right to the edge. So he steps in. Now, pardon this intrusion, too. He steps in and goes, hey, man, the days of slavery are over. And I went, what? Are you what? What's this got to do with that? That make a difference what color you are, what color I am. And that's when things started. I will turn down and I go, you know something? There's a right way and a wrong way to play the game, and you're playing it wrong. And guess what? It offends guys like me. So if you don't play this friggin' game right, I'm gonna kick your ass right here at home plate in Yankee Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah! Yeah! <laughs> I'm getting a little excited right now, as a matter of fact. I'm getting a little excited. And, I, and, why, and why I would say that for a guy wearing the Yankee uniform after wearing the Red Sox uniform all this time, I don't know. But there's a certain respect for the game <laughs> The, the Yankees, Yankee Stadium, the tradition. I don't care whether you're playing in San Diego or you're playing in Yankee Stadium or Fenway Park or Cincinnati or wherever you are. You're wearing this uniform. You represent more than just yourself inside that uniform. And he wasn't representing anything but himself. And I swear, the guys in there were turning over in their graves watching this guy play baseball in Yankee Stadium. And it offended me. I mean, I, we had the greatest rivalry in the American League. I don't know about the National League, but I can't speak about that. But we had the greatest rivalry in the American League, in the history of the American League, the Red Sox and the Yankees, and this guy was stomping all over it. And those guys are turning over in their grave. Relax. To, relax. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll tell you what. You get a little passionate about the game, and this guy, it was just... I mean, he's right. I mean, he's absolutely telling you right. Absolutely. It's all perception. Right. Before we go, how tough is it, Gary Carter, mm -hmm. to know when it's time to get out, to give up the game? Well, it's very difficult. I went through that uh, my last year in 92, and it was very difficult to let it go because it was something that I've been doing since I was like eight years old. And uh, when, you, when you come to grips at 38 and realize, and just to finalize what these guys were saying, there was a respect for the game. I love the game. And I was so fortunate to have been able to play 18 Major League seasons, to play against guys like Johnny play in all-star games against guys like Pudge and to watch guys like Yogi growing up in Southern California and and being a fan and having a big baseball card collection and all that kind of stuff when you come to grips with that and still a young man and to say it's over that's very difficult very very difficult how did you know 
because uh, my body was so beaten up and broken down with all these knee surgeries and all that I had, I realized uh, in, in 92 when I finally played my last game, I was hurting really so bad and I had double knee surgery at the end of that year and it was the right time. And when I did say goodbye, you know, God really blessed me by in my last game to have a game winning double. You know, and standing out there on second base, and Felipe Alou had a runner come in and run for me, and then it was over. And it was like, whew, you know, it, it's, it's like a relief, but then it was like, when it came close to spring training, I was chomping at the bit and wanted to get back out there again, but I realized it was time to let it go. Yogi, how did you know? When did you know? When I, well, I was 38 years old, too. Uh, I missed one year because I made me run over the Mets. And, uh, when Tony Kleiner just struck me out three times, I knew I, I had it. I never, struck, I never struck out three times in my life. That was it. That was it. And did you have a hard time adjusting to not going back to spring training? No, I always went back. I went to coach for the Mets. You stayed with the game. game, game. I stayed with the game. So a little, a little so, easier. Yeah, very much easier. When did you know and how did you know? Uh, when I when I needed the surgery on the elbow and everything was kind of aching, but I I didn't look forward to going to the ballpark and I couldn't play like Johnny Bench. Right. And once you have a standard and a level yeah. that that you don't need to be out there, so uh, there was this third person in many ways in your mind, Johnny Bench. There was always there's always three lives. There was the life before, there was life during baseball, and there's life after baseball. And when you had to move on, you had to go through the stages. But yeah, there was always you were always dealing with that, and it was. Uh, where was I going? What was I going to do? And I couldn't be who I wanted to be on the field, and it was time. Mm -hmm. And as long as you step away on your own accord, mm -hmm. you can live with it. Pudge, you hit more home runs after the age of 40 than any man who's ever played Major League Baseball. You played to your 45 years old. When did you know? How did you know to get he out? He still thinks he can play. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he can. And he probably could. I mean, he's in good physical shape and probably could. I always thought that I had something to contribute whether I could play every day or not. But I think the saddest, I don't know if with a, a player, I, I know I was not the player that was, could recognize when I was done. Because I think the saddest part about being a player is the day that you admit to yourself, and I never did, that's why I played as long as I did, I never admitted that I couldn't play anymore. But the saddest part is that when you say, I can't play anymore, there's something in you that dies. Mm -hmm. Something in me died. And because right now, I've, the only thing I wish, he said, you miss baseball? You know, I don't miss anything but being young enough and having the ability to play. I miss that part of the game of baseball. I don't miss anything else. You know, the hits, the runs, the strikeouts, the rest of it. I don't miss that part. I miss being able to play the game. And I know I can't play it anymore. But the fact that when I played throughout the course of my career, the surgeries, the, the, the rest of it, you know, I missed six going on seven years in the prime of my career because of surgeries and injuries. And, but then you get back to the condition part. I did play till I was 45, and as a result, when I was done, I knew I was done. There was nothing left in the tank. So I have no regrets about whether I think I left too early or whether I could have played. But I did not leave. I didn't quit. I got the pink slip. Who was the biggest influence on your life? Mickey Mantle, my father. Oh, wow. And on my life or my career? Both. Probably uh, my mother and father and a guy named Daryl Johnson. Ditto with Johnny, and Mick, Mickey Mantle and my dad. My brothers. Amen. My dad didn't know anything about baseball. <laughs> <laughs> he was working too hard. God, yeah. What a great night. What a great yeah, night. Good. Gary Carter. Good. Thank you. Punch. Pudge. Johnny. Yogi. Oh, good. The best. Yeah. Thank you all. Hall of Fame. Thank you all. The Yogi Bear Museum and Learning Center. Thank you all.